in introducing uh, our guest, David Weigel, um, I uh, thought back to the time when Semaphore opened for business, and uh, it was a fraught time mm -hmm. at best. And I thought that um, the co-founder, Justin Smith, s summed it up very well. He was quoted in the New York Times as saying, we're launching at a time when the smoldering carcasses of scaled media were littered everywhere. And that's probably an understatement because the carcasses keep piling up. Uh, but nearly a year later, uh, Semaphore is finding its voice. And our guest, a, a longtime political reporter, David Weigel, has made his Americana newsletter a must read, uh, not only for uh, the, the political beat, but beyond. Uh, David is here to talk with us about how a startup finds its identity in a crowded, crowded space and his role as a, a founding re reporter in shaping that enterprise. And I expect there will be a few questions about politics along the way. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to David. Mm -hmm. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll just introduce myself going off of, of the information there and start opening things for questions because that's that's I think more fun for everybody but yeah I uh, this is September 11th and about a year ago I had just c confirmed to Ben Smith and Justin Smith and the rest and Gina the rest of people at Semaphore that I wanted to go over I started on the 26th so we will have been about a year there and I I joined partly because I realized that that's one sort of job I'd never had I had I started out in journalism uh, doing internships, uh, one that was paid, a couple that weren't, for uh, publications that would hire me. There were, I think, more at the time than there are now. Uh, and then went to a nonprofit startup in 2009, doesn't exist anymore, called the Washington Independent. Uh, went to uh, Slate from, uh, sorry, the Washington Post first from there, then Slate, uh, then to Bloomberg. And when I joined Bloomberg, I, I, I made a conscious decision. I've worked at smaller places, startups, I've been an intern. I've never been at a big news organization where you get a, if you want a corporate credit card, where if there's something happening on your beat, you can go and travel uh, with just one manager sign off. Uh, it changed the way I did reporting. I, I became someone who not just was following politics around the country, but somebody who could go and try to get in, in front of whatever I was writing about. Uh, and I continued that at the Post. Uh, I was there for seven years. I'd known Ben Smith for, I think that point, yeah, about 11 years. I, I, I had read a little bit about his idea starting this publication. And it's, uh, it's a nice problem to have, but it's, it's, a, it's always tough when you have a job that you like quite a lot and you, you know you have to write a message saying, this has been growing great. I could spend my whole career here. However, <laughs> I'd like to try something brand new that, that doesn't exist yet. Uh, I didn't think I was the kind of person who would, who would do that, but... I was convinced from talking to Ben, who I'd known forever, from the other people who I hadn't known quite as well, from some of the people they were hiring, uh, that this was a rare opportunity, uh, that you could start up a new media organization, do what you were doing, kind of get an acid test of whether people who'd been talking to you were talking to you because of who you were, because they, they liked the Washington Post name or the, or the Bloomberg name, uh, and then shape how that publication worked. Um, because we weren't going to just cover politics, and we don't. We cover, uh, we cover finance, most of the early scoops, uh, uh, that that I think established the website were about the implosion of crypto, including one of the founder uh, fo funders, I shouldn't say found uh, funders of the company, Sam Bankman Fried. All his money was then you know cordoned off, do donated back, um, clawed back. They love that term. Uh, <laughs> like, I like it too. It's much more evocative. And uh, but we were breaking news on a thing that that directly affected the the publication's bottom line and and and, and life. I thought that was exciting. Uh, in covering politics, I, I, I had been for years, so I, I should say 2015 is when I, I go to, um, 14 is when I go to Bloomberg. I had for years gotten used to traveling the country for stories um, in a way that I thought would be helpful for understanding the story. So not just here, I need a, I need a backdrop. Uh, I want to get a couple quotes from New Hampshire. I'm going to go up there. But what is something interesting happening where I can do some research, meet a bunch of people, stay a few days and write about it? And it was clear I could do that at this startup and also uh, have the chance to uh, make the startup identified with that. And I think I th if we have an identity in covering politics, it's very interested in breaking policy news. 
a very, uh, I think, without fear, without fear or favor when it comes to covering Republicans and Democrats, and ha with access to, to both parties, important right now because a lot of Republicans don't like talking to a lot of media, uh, and also that we would be lots of places. And lot, some, so we were not going to be a startup where you'd, you'd see the headline and it would be aggregating something else. It would be, we're there, we have something new to say, we, we broke some piece of this, we have an exclusive interview. Uh, the basics, the stuff I always like doing, um, which I've been lucky enough to do at, at the Post and Bloomberg. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I left to get that going. It was exciting. Uh, I wouldn't even say scary. It was really after a, a, couple, a couple, I think the first thing I remember missing <laughs> as a perk was just the expensing system, which does matter <laughs> at the startup was, 20% more co convoluted and slow than the, the post one. And I thought, oh, God, what have I given up? <laughs> I had that system <laughs> locked out. Because, but I, it, it let me sort of recalibrate what did I find interesting? Because no, uh, one thing about the post, or, uh, more than Bloomberg, I'd say, is people will come to you with a story that might be interesting. They just want to place it there. I, I at Semaphore, got some of that, but, but was spending more time trying to find something either unique or an angle on the story that I didn't think anyone else was going to write and, and just did that. So I, that is the basics of how we work. Um, we publish on online only. We, pu uh, we have a, a lot of our, uh, business, business model is about events and about newsletters with some, some of them, which have ads in them. I write one that comes out twice a week. I help write one that comes out every day. Uh, and I found in the last year, uh, I should court, chop up the months. First couple months or so, people wondered what it was was about. I mentioned the SBF thing that helped define it, I think, negatively for eh, like a month or so. Uh, and since then, I've I found this very points in my life. If you're just doing something <laughs> like worthwhile and interesting, people will move on from the last thing they knew about and say, oh, I saw this really good story in that, in that site. So we had this um, over, I think, Four or five months into the, the website's life and existence, we noticed that it was get things were getting pick up. Um, the kind of pick we cared about. We would have. I remember one of the first ones was we uh, did an interview with Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, who was considering running for president. Uh, and we can probably get into how boring I feel like a lot of presidential campaign coverage can be because they get asked the same Trump questions, they get all this. We pushed him in a few different directions. Uh, he he went into a. Uh, a long digression because one of his focuses was was beating the teachers unions uh, state to state. We went well, a digression about how Randy Weigarten was the biggest threat, head of the American Federation of Teachers, biggest threat to America. I saw that get <laughs> picked up. I saw people credit it, and I said, "Okay, this is the kind of you, there's there's a couple, several kinds of scoop. There's the one there's the one that you uncover from reporting. There's the one that somebody hands you, and there's the one that just in the course of doing your job, if you ask the right questions, you get." Uh, an exclusive a scoop, the first quote on something from there. And I thought, great, okay, we're doing this. And that's that's been my ex experience for the last, that was in October last year. It's, ever since then, when things have hit in a, in a good way, it's because we have a perspective and we have ac not just access that people are handing to us, but we have access because of what we, how we've been reporting. Because we, we people came from the Post, people came from the Times, uh, people came from, I'd say, more left... Um, coded outlets than right coded outlets. But what we found quite, pretty quickly was that as new as we were, um, being new had advantages and being not one of the big DC publications people had heard of had, had big advantages in covering conservatives. Uh, there were conservatives who just did not want to talk to the Post at all, had not because they had a, a, a bad experience or they were misquoted, they just, they just decided that that was not part of the media world anymore. Their voters didn't read it. They didn't care. The story would be framed in a way they didn't like. Um, and they did talk to us. And it wasn't that we were going easy on them. They just they just had a fresh, they had a, a, a new opening to people who were, pub were publishing what they said, uh, knew what they were working on, asked questions that showed we were interested. And that went very well. I found that going to a startup that doesn't have an identity at all until you join uh, does give you the chance to not just reintroduce yourself to sources, but reintroduce completely what your what your media company is um because i i've i've been in places and i've i've been part of the problem sometimes where people have a very calcified idea of what the institution is what kind of story it's gonna it's gonna be i didn't have the problems with necessarily the way things were, were edited or how they're framed but sometimes sometimes you'd, you'd notice well, the way that, that we put the story together was very cookie cutter we put 
uh, the kind of one of these three swarms of leads we always do. These quotes are from people that we always that we always go, go to react quotes to going to something brand new and saying, all right, new identity, new publication. This is going to be this is going to be done differently than the people that that you are tired of, of, of hearing from your Axios is your, I'm not trying to be negative about them, but just from the, from the, from the campaigns and the politicians and the lobbyists and perspective, people that they're like, ah, if I give them a quote, I know what's going to happen to it. And the way we publish, which the last thing I'll get to, I should have made it sooner was, uh, the, including in the newsletter for my lead story, we break apart the news part of something from analysis. And we, we put the analysis in kind of different categories. Let's, uh, an example, I always think of how we do this is, it, let's say there's a, a Biden announcement uh, today. Uh, there's an unemployment, it happened last week. Let's say there's a new unemployment number today and it was bad. It was, uh, unemployment jumps by one point. Um, a traditional inverted pyramid AP story or something, something that has more of a voice might say, in, in a development that could uh, hinder the president's reelection campaign, you know, this unemployment went up. The way that we would write it is, Unemployment went up by by one point. That's the news. Uh, the White House reaction. That's the news. And then in analysis, if you want people saying that, you could you could quote people saying different takes on this. You could have somebody saying this. Everyone's wrong about the data. Somebody saying this is awful and he's going to lose. Um, we found pretty quickly that people liked that format. The, the, the kind of people I was talking to, and this is left and right, but more conservatives. They really liked that their 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 story, their quote was not going to appear as. Uh, you know, like parsley on top of something that had already been cooked uh, for the story, but that it was, they were going to appear in there. And if you wanted just the hard news that you're reading in 20 seconds, you'd get it right in there. The quote would be in there. The fact would be in there. And if people want to keep going, they could, they could, they could. That was not my idea. That was Ben Smith. That was the people who founded the company. But I found that to be a huge help in uh, introducing my, reintroducing myself to people and also people finding the publication saying, oh, this is worth reading. Uh, so, those are the basics of how I joined it and how we work. Uh, I want to open it up as much as possible to any question about any, anything. Uh, it, if, if somebody wants to know more about like some aspect I talked about and I, and I didn't address it, I can start there. But how do you do it? Do you do you call on no, people? Or do people just no, come, it, we'll, come up and we'll, okay. we'll open it up? All right, sure. Let me get a uh, microphone to you. Um, Brian Metzger with Insider. I uh, wanted to ask you just one thing that I've always admired about your reporting is your ability to like identify trends right. and ideas and concepts and sort of big picture things that are happening and stitch it all together. Um, how do you do that? Like, yeah. are you super online? Do you read a lot? Is it from talking to people? Like, how do you do that sort of reporting? Uh, really, all three of those those things. Uh, the the all of them sound like a little bit like patting on the back, but I think it's important because. There, you can come to DC and get into access journalism and not really find anything new. Uh, you can see there, there'll be a story about a campaign development where I read it and it's like, okay, here's a reaction quote from a pollster. Um, here is a quote from the press secretary. Um, there's no context about where what what this poll looked like last month. There's no context about what what happened a year ago. I didn't learn anything in this from this. My thought has has always been, um, what what can this story contain that will be new to people? Uh, and that starts often with, okay, what can I write about that is going to be at least a little bit new? Because it's not everything's going to be new. I mean, there's, I'm writing some stuff this week that is on campaigns or on books that have been written about, but I talk to more people. Uh, so it's a combination of that. So I try to, uh, the hardest one logistically, just if someone was starting off, is just going to places and talking to people. Um, I would, hard might, might be the wrong word, but I, as somebody who is, I wouldn't call myself extroverted. I can be at some event. I can be at something that I traveled to, you know, two flight connection. I drove an hour to it. I'm get there. I'm sort of tired and I'm sitting in the corner talking to other reporters. I used to have to, I have to break that habit. Uh, I don't do a lot of just pure men on the street, like walking around in a, in a downtown or a mall. I've done some of it, but most stories I'm writing about, people aren't, aren't super aware of them at the moment. I mean, I found, unless it's a presidential race, horse race, or a scandal, if I were to go up and start asking people in a, like I, in this weekend I was in Virginia for these state elections, and if I were to go up to the, like the, a shopping mall in Leesburg and I asked them, what do you think of state Senate candidate Russett Perry versus Juan Paul Segura? No one knows who they are. I mean, so I end up going to stuff where people are already politically motivated to show up. Uh, that's a certain sort of person, but if you're just talking to those people, you're already learning something. And it this happens a lot, especially with conservatives in the last 
eight years. A lot of people you're talking to won't want to use their names or something. And I try to just get some something out of every conversation, even if I'm not going to use the quote in a story. I'm interacting with people that I would not normally be colliding with. Um, but that's important. I mean, I had a moment when I was covering uh, Trump in 2016 at the Post, where I, I just had like a almost out of body experience, where I, I, I looked around, you know, there's the Trump stage, there are a crowd, there's the uh, stages where the media cameras are set up behind that are the, are the reporters. And I wasn't trying to look at everyone's laptop. But I could see everyone around me was just literally booking their um, flight, flights and hotels the next day. And Trump was talking. And I think this was a period of the campaign, I don't think this informed it, but a period of the campaign where people thought, ah, oh, he can't obviously win. What's the point of this? But I looked around and was like, why are we here? Why did this come here for just going to like sit in this pen and book hotels for the next thing we cannot pay attention to? So talking to people is important. Um, staying online, there are different ways to do it. Uh, I've definitely screwed it up in the past, just been on two online, getting into fights and getting into stupid things uh, that I didn't need to. Uh, like my current normal, my method of being online right now is uh, I have a bunch of tabs. I've just curated sites that I check for 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 news that I'm going to find interesting. There's everything from like Daily Coast, the American Conservative. Just they're going to be publishing stuff, and there might be an interview with somebody I wouldn't have think, thought to talk about. And, oh, that's interesting. Or a couple pieces are on the same topic, and I wonder is there a trend here. Uh, and I have Twitter on my laptop, but not on my phone. I had it on my phone forever. Um, just to, I, I like, I, I, for the thing I just talked about, I like not having the distraction of I'm feeling socially awkward at the moment or not socially awkward, more like six people just told me they want to talk to me, so I'm going to check Twitter. I wanted to break that habit. Um, so I check, I check it a bunch. Uh, I'll, I have uh, my main account follows a ton of people. I've created lists. Uh, oh, it's called X now, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but I've created lists that, uh, for one, I have list of every Republican running for office, list of every Democrat running for office. Uh, my point of this, be, my point is, is saying this: you need to just put in some amount of effort that sounds that seems silly at the time in curating how you follow news. Like I did it over several days. I spent several days building lists of people, going to each website, pulling an input, and in six months, well, that'll be irrelevant because people will drop out. But I would find, oh, okay, uh, I'm getting an idea from this this list I've curated because 50 Republican members of Congress are all talking about the same clip of Biden saying something uh, or and on the other side or every Democrat is now commemorating this thing I hadn't heard of. I would just get some ideas from you just need to kind of know where to look, but you have to curate how you're looking to it because otherwise it is just a bunch of a bunch of noise, a bunch of not just noise, but noise with um, the presence of people who know how to exploit uh, the, the system. And, and I'll see this a lot. Why is everyone? Why is there a TV segment about this thing? It's because the RNC rapid response team tweeted the thing, and then I remember Congress retweeted the thing that changed the story for the day. Um, I, it's a more technical and thing, but you know what I mean. The, you need to have your own media diet so that if something comes in and it's clearly being pushed up, you can you'll see it, but you won't say that's the only thing happening today. And then for reading, I mean, yes, I. I I do that a lot. I'm very lucky. Uh, uh, that's where we put up. Like my wife and I don't have kids yet, so we keep joking. Like there, at some point, I can't read as much as I do. I'm ready for this, but like uh, I just do all the time. I always have. I um, I don't think I read. I like my ability to read is that much better than the average person who you know went to college and got into something that involves writing. Um, but all the time, I mean, I I if if there is a book, uh, for example, uh, there is a book Washington's going to be talking about. You'll find a lot of people, this Frank Forer book about Biden that came out last week, for example, you will find a lot of people don't read the book. Maybe they'll buy a copy, they'll get it signed, or they'll read like a summary or they'll go to the index and see it. I just will take the time to read everything related to the beat that I can. Uh, if there's a l l decision, like uh, this happens a lot now, a lot of stories have come out of a court ruling some way on a state's transgender law or abortion law. Just read the the filing actually people will try to like hide the filing and not link it in the story just know how to look up the legal document and read it yourself stuff comes up to you same thing i'd say legislation's tougher legislation is actually written not you know not in a way to be consumed like a, a legal brief is you're supposed to be able to read it um and for polling i curate the kind of polling i'm always checking out what the latest is on that uh i do find for just i read a lot for fun because i feel I'm always worried about cliches and just lazy writing slipping in. So I'll always try to have just something uh, Kindle or real life that is not is not what I'm on my beat at the moment. Because there were periods where I read nothing but like nonfiction books. And now I'll read 
something like some some night in like good 19, 18th, 18th century novel and it's like this is re reminding me <laughs> that there's a different way of writing and that's stopping me from using the awful cliches like uh uh, uh the way that he, you, you there's things that, you know that make me stop a story it's just like it, 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 in a development that opens a rare window i'm like eh, click i'm not reading that anymore <laughs> but but like did ford maddox ford or like henry james have a better way to put this and then you don't want to you rip them off but just i find re rewiring myself with other writing is good um so just kind of constantly i mean i just um I don't really play like phone games. I do play PS5 at, at home if I'm burned out. Uh, which, but just making some of my downtime, like I will continue to read things. Like uh, it's a, maybe it's a cliche at this point how a lot of people in DC don't actually read the books that they talk about. But it's kind of everywhere. I mean, there's lots of people just kind of going off to know the title or they know the Wikipedia summary, but didn't get, actually get try to get the information from the source. So do that. Yeah, those, those are my three long answers to that. Yeah. Um, hi, is this on? Um, I'm Naomi with the Washington Examiner. Mm -hmm. um, just a one basic question, like mistakes that you see Cub campaign reporters make. Right. Um, and then also I'm curious to know your thoughts about this evolving media strategy that we're kind of seeing where the Republican candidates started really sort of, you know, just talking to conservative outlets. And then you saw Ron DeSantis sort of open up with his, you know, one, two, second, third reset. And now even sort of Nikki Haley is making more inroads with sort of mainstream media what just would love to know your insight on or why you think that's happening no i i can answer the second part first because i've been doing this since i should have put dates in the beginning i started really 2006 covering campaigns and i covered them for reason magazine was the first place i worked for which is a libertarian magazine but but it, like you have to fight a little bit more for access uh and so it, since that time uh there's a long-term goal of the conservative movement donors uh politicians editors etc to create uh, a media that can fully inform and feed with information conser a conservative audience you don't need the mainstream media for. Uh, that has succeeded, I think, mostly because of the w uh, ways which the internet uh, and cable cord cutting and the rest of it uh, broke the cord broke the connection between the average news consumer and you know one one not monotonous but but the one the words escaping me the one I was say narrative is not even the right one but let, let's say if i'm looking at campaign news in 2004 it would matter a lot what made it on the nightly news what made it on the a1 of the new york times what made it on cnn uh you want those hits you want that attention you need to get that sometimes to make yourself accessible in ways that might hurt the candidate and the dream has been what if we don't need to do that what if what if we have conservative podcasts what if we have conservative media what if we can create our own that then we can cut out even you know the wall street journal that was the santis's goal more explicitly than anyone else i've covered uh one story wrote in 2022 yes it was he, he he had a event that used to be open press florida gop convention that was he made closed press i went to write about how it was closed press and the campaign was literally uh uh his staffers florida gop and DeSantis staffers more than once just came out of the room and took photos of the media who had the same idea. We're, up, we're covering people as they come out. We have interviews set up. Very common that we have to sit in a hallway and wait for something to be over. It's not that weird. But they were just taking photos and making fun of the media for not being allowed in. Who they did let in were outlets that just DeSantis himself had kind of inflated. Uh, Florida Standard, things that had been started up by him or conservative things that existed that he preferred. And DeSantis, who I think had been, especially by 60 Minutes and some other coverage, he just wanted to replace the media. I mean, he wanted to like, make the Miami Herald irrelevant. I think his press secretary's image on, on Twitter is still like a meme making fun of the Miami Herald. They just really hate the mainstream media and think it's out to get them. And I'm not saying they think that because it's wrong. I think they are they getting occasionally some uh, scandal-driven coverage that's not going to hold up. I think sometimes they are. But that's what's been happening with the campaigns. This cycle has moved them further in that direction than ever before. They're not entirely there yet. I think you found that with DeSantis that um, blowing off the media, the rest of the media completely just isn't a good strategy. They're getting outplayed and better coverage, uh, worse coverage, I should say, than the Trump campaign. Uh, there's an old uh, Robert Novak uh, line, which I every time I use people, people in politics are like, you shouldn't admit that. But it was Novak, not me. Like You're either a source or you're a target. You, if you're not talking to the press, they will write about you. 
they'll be talking to other people who are not you. So they can go around, do the job, and, and, and that's often part of the job. Hey, you're not handing me these documents. I need to figure something out. But for a campaign, if you're just going out there and never talking to the press, the press corps, never taking questions, and everyone else is, you, could, you can see your ability to get a message beyond the people showing up in that room and reading these websites, etc. It's not that great. And it, what if... Uh, one of these networks has more positive coverage of somebody not that you're run, in, in the, I think in the Santos case, like Nikki Haley's campaign, Tim Scott's campaign, we're just getting much better coverage than him. Here's actual coverage of what they're running on. Here's an interview on the substance of what they want to do. Once DeSantis changed, I don't think it's it's uh, moving the same track as his his polling. But once he did a few interviews, Jake Tapper, etc., they were fine. But it was already kind of curled because they wanted to replace the, the media. That is more than I've ever seen it. And if you go down below the presidential level, there are a lot of campaigns that just do not want media, mainstream media coverage that they don't see the upside. I mean, the first time I saw that explicitly, and I appreciate them making explicit, was in 2020, I was thinking of covering uh, this runoff between now Senator Tommy Tuberville and Jeff Sessions. And I contacted the Tuberville campaign. They got back right away and said, hey, we're not doing any media of any kind. We're just not doing it because we're up by 20 points and there is no advantage doing this. We're just going to ride this out. And they did, and that's what and they knew that they could win without it. I've seen that happen more frequently uh, in some some campaigns down ballot, where they're not even going to hire a press secretary. You're just going to have to work around it. And it might not, and sometimes it comes from that contempt. Sometimes it just why bother? Like, what's the point of sitting the person down for 20 minutes where one question shows up on TV news, or maybe one question they we mangle it and it, we don't look good? They've been much more defensive, much more less like political. Um, Media used to be more like corporate media, more just like, man, what's, and we'll invite you into the sales call because you write something nice about the sales call. We're not going to invite that guy who broke the story about how we lied about all, about all of our earnings. But we will invite the guy whose website we're funding <laughs> to come on the call. And a lot more like that. You, the first thing you'd ask, though, I did the second one. Um, you had like a two part question. That one. Oh. I think it's just you need to you need to come in with a lot of history and because uh, and it both of how these campaigns have worked before, who the people who you're talking to have have um, who they what they've done before at the beginning of a campaign. It's good to just introduce yourself without a story in mind. Like um, it's worse when you come up and say, hey, it's, it's the weekend before the election. Uh, can I come in to seven events? Um, it's better to say, hey, I saw your work on this. I just want to say hi. I'm going to be covering this campaign. I feel like most starting reporters I've met all, all do that, but it's really important because it's something I screwed up once in my career, like more than once. Just I, oh, suddenly I've been pushed onto a campaign. And I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, but um, it's really just uh, knowing it's easier than, I wouldn't say ever, because the easiest, easier than ever was probably eight, six years ago. The campaigns have gotten tighter. But it's easier than it was 30 years ago to just find what the candidates are saying. Uh, you can go to Rumble, you can go to YouTube, like, what have they said? Who, what, what else have they said in interviews? What have they said when they've been um, at a local uh, party event or in a debate, etc.? Uh, and doing that kind of research and also just knowing the basics of polling. There's a lot of races where there's not going to be any polling. Um, but the knowing the basics, so you're not just handed something and says, and they say, Hey, th we're not going to show you the internals, but we're up by five points. Like just knowing enough to ask the follow-ups or to put the race in context where I think this is happening a bit with, um, Biden and Trump now where, uh, and I don't see young campaign reporters making this mistake. I see just the TV coverage will be kind of glib and say, well, this poll shows that he's tied with Trump. Well, okay, look, you can find a poll from this point in 2020 and 2012. Like the, what, w there are reasons why these campaigns might have dipped in the past and they rise in the future. They have related to when they put money, put, when they put things on TV. It's, it's like, there's not one single piece of advice. It's just do a lot of research about um, the context of the campaign you're writing in. Um, and I find also, uh, don't be afraid to ask like a, a question that sounds dumb to, dumb to you. Be, uh, because the goal is not to be the reporter in the room who asks like the smartest question. The goal is to like find out something new, um, and and ideally make news. But just like find get new, introduce new facts into the into the record. Uh, ask asking them things that you know they have dodged before, or asking them things they that are brand new. They just happened. I mean, one good example I had was just 
Ted Cruz was out campaigning for Trump in the uh, final month of 2016. And every every gaggle he was getting, you know, a pretty beaten to death story by that point, which was, uh, oh, you're you're campaigning for Trump, but will you endorse him? Because you know, he, he was making a big show of not officially endorsing him because he because of various issues in the primary. And the one I just asked was, uh, hey, so if if. Hillary wins, uh, and she nominates for a Supreme Court Justice nominee for the Scalia seat. Would you like allow a vote on that? And just because I've been following that, con and I, the, no one is asking this. He hasn't put out an answer. I saw a couple, some commentary from conservative pundits who I knew he read that said that, and he said, "Oh no, we could hold it for four years. There's precedent for leaving these seats open for a very long time." And I, I wrote, you know, a story on that. I saw like it got picked up uh, by other people. Um, it wasn't that I was just a genius. I just was paying attention. Okay, what is in the what is in the conversation that he's not asked a not even a yes or no question, but he's not asked a, a, a substantive question on. And that got much more than just if I'd shown up and said like, "Hey, how does Trump win Colorado or something?" Like you just, I think one other thing. Not that's advice for everybody, but I always think one. How do you get information on the record that is like new that that other people don't have? And also, let's say it's thirty years from now and somebody is researching what happened. Did you get anything that would help them? Or did, like the, the question of the day about how they're reacting to polling, that might not be that interesting. And look, they might not want to answer a big contextual question on something else. But like, are you asking stuff that is new and useful? And that just involves, like, when you are assigned to it, man, just do a ton of research. Like, you're going to prosecute a case of some kind. Hi, uh, mm -hmm. I'm Minnie Raker with Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, you were one of my favorite reporters to read, I think because of like the uniqueness of your work okay. and also that you talk to kind of interesting different people, mm -hmm. outsiders. And that's what I would like to do, but that's kind of intention sometimes with pressure from like editors to write about whoever's in the news that day or the inside DC baseball game. And right. so I'm curious, like, did you ever run into that pressure? How did you make that case to your editors? And then how do you connect it to like something that's gonna get views and an audience? <laughs> Yeah, no, sometimes you just write about something and it doesn't get an audience. I mean, I, uh, I, I, had, I had an interview with Mike Pence a month ago. I think it was right before one of the Trump indictments. And I didn't promise them I wouldn't ask for the indictment, but I, I think I had one question about that and the rest were just things I wanted to hear him answer. So I'm keying off what I less had. Not that Pence is like a, at this race he sort of is. Like Pence is not the story of the day every day. But when he is, it's some kind of Trump thing. So I was like, all right, well, this is interesting. What can I ask him that's new? I asked him about like the the, the writer strike. I asked him about a, a bunch of like a bunch of things I had not seen him comment on that I thought like former vice president worked for Trump and can speak to what the administration did. Interesting, and like, it just didn't do very well. Like the one, so so my editors didn't push back. They weren't angry. They just were saying, yeah, you know, it turns out that asking about the news of the day would have gotten more traffic than that got. Um, you can kind of share it online the sh the parts you find interesting, but getting some the reason people are asking a lot of uh can you know, react to the latest trump thing that he said is because that gets sound the, for them talking gets on tv when asking about something else might not also a lot of times you're in a gaggle with three you know 50 reporters and they get three questions tim scott especially and him dodging something is going to make news and him him dodging that question is going to make news him answering your thing might might not um, but when it comes to just the larger world of of of, poli of politics and how you reach out to people, um, one I find the nice thing about people losing faith in the media is that they're very often very surprised when you do reach out. I mean, I'll talk to somebody who's I think is going to be deluged in requests they're getting because they're you know moms for liberty activists that are that every every time they're mentioned in the media they're 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 they're, they're uh, pilloried, and I'll email them and say, here's my story. Uh, one thing I do too is um, I don't like give people quote approval, but uh, I always tell them like, and I'll like before I'm using it, I'll like send it back so you know what it is, so it's accurate. Um, which I, I didn't do my whole career; I've done for like the last five years. That's very helpful. Um, but I find a lot of people who who are interesting and have an interesting story will respond and say, "Oh yeah, sure, I'm I can find time," and you get you get something new. I um, for something off the be beaten path, it's it's very you kind of. There's no 100% way of telling if it's going to be relevant. <laughs> if you're going to some cattle call where there's 20 candidates, then yes, you're being there, you're going to get a story that was off a thing that really happened. On going off the 
finding other characters in politics, I think it's just reaching out to people at that at that level. And uh, honestly, one thing that was very helpful for me over my whole career is I covered the Ron Paul campaign very closely in 20, 2007, 2008. I covered the Tea Party very closely. And there were people in the Tea Party movement who, um, it wasn't that people were not quoting them, it was that they would go, they'd try to get the quote from some pollster or Sarah Palin or somebody, somebody who was a big bold face name or somebody who had expert appeal uh, or expert cred credibility on their resume. And I would just try to reach out to these activist groups and, and talk and I wasn't trying to make people look bad, but like they'd have a real quote and they'd have something interesting to say uh, because a lot of people weren't coming out and talking to them or if they did, they were getting cut. I mean, I was whenever I had frustration with a story being edited, it was always I'd get some of those local voices cut out so that some of the national voices could be put into it. And I never, I, I, I found, yeah, there's an audience for that, um, but I had to kind of fight more. I'm like, no, 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 you see, this activist is, 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 nobody knows who he is, but he's been on the ground on this for four years, and he has the story. Like, you just have to, it comes from the reading and finding out what they're all working on, um, but it's just a matter of, like, reaching out, and sometimes you will find, like, I've had interviews where I thought it was promising, and then just was kind of, dull, it was kind of a dud, or, like, I didn't ask things that got good answers. Um, but the, the pushback, if somebody says, why are you doing this and not uh, a Trump arraignment thing is, uh, up to you. Uh, for me, it's often been, I think we're going to be talking about this in a month. I always, I often, uh, will look at something and say, Hey, I'm noticing something that I think will be in the bigger in the conversation later. And if we got talk about it now, we're going to be way ahead of people. Um, that's not always right. That's, that's failed sometimes, but this year I've had pretty good luck with that. I mean, I, I did a piece a month ago, uh, just watching a lot of town hall meetings that Republicans were having back home. Uh, again, stuff anyone had access to, like they put them on Facebook Live. And I noticed how many were getting questions about impeachment and saying, yes, well, here is how we should impeach uh, Joe Biden. I wrote it, talked to the White House, wrote about it. And I, I got some like pushback from people saying, why are you doing this now? And I said, well, because, yes, nobody's like rushing to quote this third term congressman from Texas the way they're quoting Rudy Giuliani or something. But in a month, we might be talking about, hey, who's this congressman who's suddenly leading this impeachment charge? Or what is this group that's spending all this money in the district? Um, like that, that's usually how I get to it is I think this will be relevant soon. So let's like, let's jump on it now. Um, that helps. That's a lot of small races you can cover that way. Uh, and if somebody's skeptical um, about, about the meaning of it, I mean, I, I did Ohio's referendum on, on abortion. That wasn't that hard of a sell. But it wasn't getting talked about that much until it, the whole vote happened. And I remember telling my editors, I think after this, this from my reporting, this looks like this is going to fail. It's going to be the latest pro-abortion rights victory. And I think if we're there like two weeks in advance, we'll be really positioned to tell a good story. And we were. Um, so, but my experience has been very nice thing about a startup is, is there's not really much pressure. Like, drop what you're doing and cover this thing. It's the opposite. There's not much interest in saying, let's p pay everyone to go. Um, to the same media event that everyone else is going to be at and write our own version. You write some, but our momentum's the other direction. It's like, right, everyone's going to be covering that. What can we cover that's a bit more unique that would get us a, like, a week ahead of them? Yeah, that's usually how the argument goes. But I, it's not for us, it's really just an argument. It's like, if you have a choice between covering a Trump rally or talking to like the Heritage Foundation president about their Trump plan to st staff the next administration, that did very well. People are aware of it, but... That wasn't the story of the day. We just, I think we're correct that, hey, you might look back in a year when there's a transition team and all of a sudden all these names you've never heard of are on the transition team. We will have known them already. But that's usually how it goes. Just we'll be ahead of the news if we do this. Um, hi, my name is Christina. I work for CBS News. Mm -hmm. um, my question is kind of like a little bit related to um, something that you just mentioned. And... Um, I've been covering the campaign trail for the past few months and something that obviously given everything that has happened with Trump and his four indictments, um, well, a lot has been, you mm -hmm. know, all, all of his indictments and the reactions of all of his opponents and, uh, as a, as a reporter, one of my concerns is, is that obviously I'm not saying that, um, 
uh, everything that is happening with him and his cases are is not important and that we shouldn't cover it because definitely we need to cover it and democracy is at stake. Um, but I'm just a little bit concerned about other important stories that are not being covered mm -hmm. with these candidates that are running for office um, mm -hmm. because we're so hyper-focused on Trump and what are the reactions and what, it, what do you think about this last indictment? And... Mm -hmm. and My question is what how can we how can we find a balance yeah. in covering such an important topic like Trump the Trump's four indictments and the fact that all these you know 11 candidates are running for office you yeah. know such an important office like the president of the United States um when we have and we are in a in a very difficult moment in the United States mm -hmm. um and I don't know. I just find it very difficult. Sometimes I'm, you know, I'm 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 being pushed by my editor, being like, but asked about the latest Trump indictment, but right. I, and then I'm like, but there's this other important topic that I really, really need to ask about because X, Y, and Z, and there are a lot of other issues happening that are at stake, and like I don't know. I'm just sometimes in conflict, and even when I'm pitching stories, for example, they. They just prefer the Trump story right. versus the other story because it's more likable. Um, and I'm like, I get it because Trump is Trump. But there are other stories that are very important as well. No, I uh, give me a little more context. So this, like, is this where you'd be like you'd be emailing a campaign with a question and they say you want to like a spokesperson or an interview with a no, candidate? No, 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 or... no, no. Like more internally. Um, oh, OK. I'm thinking. Because let, let's say it's CBS special will get people on camera um, and maybe you have... And I, I guess everyone that, here, I don't know yeah. if ever, if people can relate on like their media outlets yeah. that everything's like Trump. Um, <laughs> and I get it. I mean, I'm not saying it's not important because it no. is. But how do, you, how do you also cover other important topics that are happening right. um, that you need to ask these folks um that are running for office um when obviously these people that are on the trail have like five minutes to gaggle and you have like 10 reporters yeah, yeah. <laughs> you that's need to pick one thinking. question um but you have your editor and be like ask the trump question like you know um that's what i was that's what i was following up asking because uh no that's the trouble and um I've been in many this cycle. Gag, everyone knows what a gaggle is. It's funny. I just realized this one word. So, like sometimes I get asked by people who are not in journalism. But yeah, candidate stops. They got time for three or four questions. Uh, Tim Scott's people like to have somebody kind of pointing to the reporters who are yeah. asking it. Um, some of the Pence actually doesn't. Pence will kind of take anything. Um, Trump does not has not gaggled. He'll do kind of a tarmac thing for a couple. Um, but yeah, so you have that's a that. Yeah. Yeah, he did get. Oh, he did get do the CPAC angle, but I'm think, but since the indictments, he's done very little of that. He's not. He's like done like he yeah. He gets out of something and then yeah. takes the questions. But kind of does a statement and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's like... No, but for that in that particular situation, because it's this is the same thing covering the hill. There'll be a bill moving through the hill, and you want to ask for something else, and you'll be the person who's like, I'm, all right, 180 degrees away from that. Here's something that's not a headline today. Can you talk about this? Uh, in that situation, it's tough. What I've gotten material from is if it's a non-Trump candidate, I'd kind of asked how they as president would implement like a policy related. So for all of them, um, the uh, the way Trump wants to like in re people he wants to lay off, the number of employees wants to fire inside the DOJ, the, the, very, the very explicit idea of just we need the DOJ to be overhauled and get rid of the Trump appointed director with new people who are going to go after certain, uh, going to go after his enemies, basically. And so I think if it's a Trump-related question, I try. it can be helpful to bring it to, okay, you are also running for president. How would you govern? How, how would you approach this part of the job? Uh, I mean, one thing, I think we're, I forget what story fit into, but I, I was writing very early on about candidates coming out for using... Uh, special forces and drones to attack cartels within Mexico. And I, and that wasn't, that was more of a, that, that was a thing where if it came up at all, I'd try to follow up and get people on the record and see where they would take it. 
Uh, and it was interesting. I mean, in Iowa, that was I, it wasn't my question, but DeSantis uh, was more explicit in saying how he would use it. He followed up with um, some other candidates, Haley and Hutch Hutchinson, and they were much more careful about saying we'd have to work with the Mexican government. But just like sketching out how they would govern and use the power of the presidency that's different than, than Trump, um, that can be helpful because the most interesting answers to Trump legal questions have been, I think, one in some cases, would you pardon him? Um, but would you also get rid of the FBI director? Would you uh, would you, you know, continue the investigations of Hunter Biden? I mean, some of the things I asked Pence in the interview that got no traction was whether he would continue the Jack Smith investigation, whether he would, if by Hunter was convicted, if he'd pardon him. And he didn't say no to either of them. Those have been interesting. They're about Trump, but they're, okay, imagine it's you as president. What would you, how would you, beyond whether he's president or not, your vision of how this, how this should work and who it's accountable to, what is it? Um, but it is tough when there, the weeks when there's a Trump indictment, it's tough to get anything else. Other weeks, um, I find it's not that, it's so candidate to candidate. If you're just talking about the 2020, 2024 candidates, like Haley's campaign does not gaggle. She does uh, statements. She usually does a Fox hit off the statement. She's done more media recently. Yeah, um, but she doesn't, she usually doesn't release statements regarding Trump. No, she yeah. will try to take the topic to something like uh, she wants to talk about China this week. So she'll, she'll the statement about that, or the statement about parents. You can make news by uh, following up on a couple of questions about, okay, so, and actually, this is where Trump is helpful. Trump actually has more detailed, uh, policy prescriptions for how he would govern again than anybody else running. And every time I every time I say this, people are in disbelief. But no, you can go to the website, you can talk to his advisors. Uh, they have ideas for how they would, uh, from everything from like environmental policy, gender identity, abortion, and abortion's the one exception. That they've been asked about. Uh, but you can kind of go to the way that Trump would re would use the power of the presidency and, 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 from there, ask ask people the questions about it. And that's one thing with with some of the the gender issues. That's I've come to the campaigns like just saying, okay, you have the power as president to do this. Would you do that? And then go back to a group. There's just every the president presidential campaign presidential campaign can be about everything. Uh, it's not usually this small and tailored to like reacting to one person. Uh, and their candidates are going to want to take it back to one of their, their talking points. If you ask a Trump question, they're going to want to both repeat themselves and say it's only the media that asked them about this. So knowing that, you can be like, all right, well, so you want to do this. Like, why should Chris Ray be fired? Like, this is like a good follow up. Like, um, what would stop this Democratic president from coming in, appointing new, new, new people and going after Republicans? Just think of how you can make it how anyone else, if they, if they want and not him would would operate but yeah there's some weeks they're just a loss like um when there's indictment news and the cameras are all trained on the on the courthouse that's like that's it if you try to counter program it's just not going to work it's like the the horror movie that came out the same weekend as barbie and oppenheimer like no one saw it <laughs> it was like a very clever idea but it didn't work hi i'm mariana with the washington post oh, um oh yeah. i have a kind of opposite question from that it's just um, there's been some kind of criticism that we might be focusing too much on the GOP candidates, given how the thing, the polls are going. Right. So where do you draw the line between like, you know, Nikki Haley has this thing that she's saying and this is how she would govern or like what you mentioned about, like, these are the folks that they're like talking about and, and, and putting up, but also dealing with the reality that Trump is so much ahead of them in the polls and that yeah. he is the likely nominee. Where do you draw the line? That's question number one. Number two, um, we're talking a lot about, you know, how you would reach out to different types of voters and you get all these very interesting conversations. How are you tackling the Gen Z vote now that it's becoming a bigger block of mm -hmm. voters? Yeah, the Gen Z votes a, is, a, is, a, is a good question because uh, the it's a big block of voters that's less trustful of parties. This is kind of typical. You'll see over time, it's, it's it, every generation it amps up. But usually the voters who are least satisfied with their choices, most interested in the third party, etc., are like the first, the youngest voters. So in 2000, it was the voters under 30 who were most interested in third party. Same thing in 2016. It always happens. Uh, the one, I think, uh, I do less of that directly. The one thing I think is you can't just talk to like college students. There's often this way of reporting where people go to a campus and they ask, what, most, actually most people are not going to go <laughs> to a four-year college, period. You're getting a certain sample of, of folks. Um, 
So I actually, I think I, I, I've gotten some somewhere by talking to groups that work on those issues, getting some advice from them and then and then going. You don't want to be, you know, like the Steve Buscemi meme of just like showing up uh, at, at like uh, at like a, uh, it wouldn't even be a mall anymore, <laughs> but like an outdoor mall. You know, you, you want to see like young people wearing vintage, you know, fake vintage Nirvana shirts, be like, hey, kids, what do you think of politics? Um, I usually try to go through a group first, but with with that idea of like I don't want to just talk to like kids on campus because these campus are different. Uh, on and on on the candidates, yeah, I probably talked too much on the, the last question, but it just um, as a horse race, it never makes sense uh, to cover somebody polling at five percent. Uh, I, I mean, I, I definitely remember once at the I, at the post in 15, 16, my beat was kind of roaming, but I was focused a lot on Rand Paul. At one point, my editor just said, Dave, you're really not covering Rand Paul anymore. Like, you don't need to bother going to every Rand Paul event. Uh, um, but uh, I think it's the overall story, like, someone will be president, someone will be the nominee. At this point, it looks like uh, Trump. But what does everyone in the party stand for? Uh is an ongoing interesting question. What, uh, what did they? What is their unanimity on? Where there wasn't six or pre-Trump, I guess. Uh, that I found has been very consistently interesting in this primary because, uh, and I think I wrote something. I think I wrote about it in this in the in the the military action Mexico. Like there was a real discussion among Republicans in 2016 about what uh, whether we should do immigration reform with a blanket amnesty guest worker program. There was a lot. There was opposition to building a border wall from Jeb Bush, from uh, Chris Christie, from a few other people. Nikki Haley criticized a border wall. So when there's unit, all of a sudden unanimity on these things, I think that's the root of an interesting story. Of everyone has moved on to this topic. In 2019 with Biden, it was on abortion. Um, the fact that uh, Biden, because he was a different kind of front runner in that point, he was a couple points ahead, but not like 50. But still, it was a really good substantive story about how he was pushed on abortion where he had been in that point the outlier in the party of saying he supported the Hyde Amendment and then he dropped his support for the Hyde Amendment uh, how would they use the, the, the like the story let's skip a year ahead it might be Trump won the nomination it wasn't even that close uh, what was the point of covering any of this I think getting just people on the record on issues that will that will be relevant when he is if, if, if Trump is president or relevant beyond then it's just it's just useful. I mean, if the if the next class of Republicans who then will be angry for twenty twenty eight all agree on for uh, all agree on uh, universal school choice, or all agree on building a border wall, or lowering the number of asylum seekers, or climate where there's actually some interesting differences, getting that on the record, you can find out. Oh, eight years later, I'm really glad <laughs> that somebody asked this person what they thought. Um, because you look at the story, it's like, yeah, you know, if somebody had just hadn't quoted this town hall where this person had a 180-degree different position, we would never know. Um, so I, I think in covering the other candidates, it's, it, they don't like the Trump question. They actually, frankly, use the Trump question as like a dodge to not do media. Uh, they overlearn this lesson because Glenn Youngkin did barely any media except for TV set interviews in 2021. They all said, oh, that's the way you do it. Is They're all, all going to ask about Trump, so starve them out. Um, but if you don't want to, <laughs> you can just be getting them on the record. Like, oh, and Trump was president. He has a record. You can get them uh, to say whether they would abandon this. Would they reappoint this person? There's a lot you can do, even if they're not going to be the nominee. Because then, for all you know, Vivek Ramaswamy, will he be the nominee? Doesn't look very late right now. Will he be up for some cabinet position? Will he be founding a business after it's over? Like getting him on the record, getting him on the record on his vision of government in any format, I think is is just is is going to be helpful to somebody at some point. All the interviews Pete Buttigieg did, um, like I don't know what his long term future in the party is, but having all that, all what Kamala Harris stood for and how she's changed, like um, the, what the people who are still relevant, you get them now because um, they they're uh, yeah, that's it basically. I'd say just asking them. Stuff is helpful, even if they're not. Even if it's going to be somebody who might drop out, like within, you know, a week of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, maybe we're retreading ground we've already covered with this question, but I you brought up Vivek Ramaswamy and yeah, like yeah. he's a, he's. I don't know. He he really sticks out to me as like someone who's running this cycle, who truly is just like doing it for kind of like yeah promotional reasons, mm -hmm. um, kind of just off the cuff, like mm -hmm. whatever. 
um, I think it was Matt Iglesias that talked about his sort of boomlet as being the product of bored journalist syndrome. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm curious, like kind of specifically about him, like how do you think of him and that type of candidate and how you cover them? Yeah, we covered at Semaphore him pretty early. We did an interview. I'd say he was in the race for like, a, I remember thinking, oh, we're late to it because Politico wrote along with him before he launched. And I thought, oh, I wish you'd written that. I did pretty early. One thing I thought was interesting uh, with him is we did, we, we talked about a number of topics. Again, I, he's written three books, so we didn't need to go over everything, but you, we can go over inc inconsistencies, what he said, which has started to happen. Um, but I remember I, we asked him uh, a, a gender question uh, a couple of gender policy questions, and he just like didn't have an answer. Didn't really wasn't really interested in talking about it. You can't tell. And then a month later, he jumped on top of Bud Light and all that. And now he's he's it's, it was very revealing to us as a, as a coverage, and also um, I think as a reflection of what the Republican base wants is that the more he went out and campaigned in Iowa and South Carolina, New Hampshire, the more he was saying, "Okay, I'm going to start saying this is a mental illness now." That's that's my new that's my new. Uh, my new policy is saying this. Um, so I I think you have to be careful with that sort of candidate. Uh, the coverage, I actually think coverage is pretty, like I'm thinking of the Times coverage, Jonathan Wiseman, some other people did, of what is he saying? Why is this catching on? If it's not catching on at all, that's the story. There was a good me messenger story um, over Labor Day about, about Pence in New Hampshire, where it was just following Pence around and noting how few people were showing up and how most people showing up didn't want to vote for him. That was useful, I think. The story of the Mike Pence campaign, even if he doesn't get anywhere close, even if he drops up for Iowa, is just new and useful. We've never had a vice president running against his former president, certainly not when they've been this much in disagreement before, uh, ever. Um, and it's not like horse race coverage. It is just we are following this guy around as he deals with other things. We are looking at how he's, he's carved out a more conservative view of what the party should stand for, everything from from actually, you know, cutting back Social Security, Medicare to uh, one promise he made. It wasn't me first, but I kind of followed up on it was he would only appoint pro-life cabinet nominees. That stuff is interesting. Uh, and and also talking to the, the groups in politics, you have to be kind of careful which group is just like a letterhead that doesn't have any clout, which one's real. But when you talk to the ones that are out there in the groups, uh, the people, the heritage, everybody there, Susan B. Anthony list, uh, the groups that these people... Um, I was about to say patronize the ones that they actually talk to. They have access to the candidate. Uh, they often are using the candidates who are not Trump to get something else out there, using it a little, maybe a little bit determinative. Um, but for Susan B. Anthony List, for example, is a good example is a good case here. They would like Donald Trump to sign a pledge saying uh, or promise to ban abortion after 15 weeks. Uh, they have not created a pledge. They have not, uh, be, partly because Trump doesn't feel like he needs to. Uh, but I think the coverage of what they're doing and trying to get people to do that, of Nikki Haley showing up and not doing that at all, of, of, of what they're trying to do and, and how the conversation they're trying to have is, is interesting. I mean, and in Congress, there's just a lot of stuff that uh, interesting members of Congress are going to introduce with a thought behind it. And it's a great, it's a, as a policy discussion, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, the conservatives who believe that we should copy some policies from Hungary and make it cheaper and easier to form a family with tax benefits, or I'll ask people about that. I mean, I ask, if you ask candidates or pro-lifers about that, um, not out of the blue, just kind of like talking to the campaign, uh, or if you hear that they met with somebody who deals with it, those are good stories. And if, if the story is, hey, this candidate polling at 4% um, has this idea, uh, you don't know that the idea is never going to be picked up by somebody else. You really don't. I mean, I... This is where not every campaign is 2008, but this is where covering R Ron Paul really set my uh, neurons for this stuff because he would give a speech that was, if, if you were not interested in him, just rambling, it made, it, you didn't know what he was talking about, but he would go on about some hard money and anti-Fed ideas that then I would hear 15 years later in Trump, in Trump campaign or Trump policy people's network. And he was never pulling that high. I think he, he got... Once, like, everyone dropped out, he was getting, you know, 15% in, in, in a state. But quoting him and quoting that ideological sector of the party was interesting, because you're also, in covering any political campaign, 
you're covering the candidates, you're covering voters, you're covering the many interest groups um, that want to sh either shape the administration, staff the administration, get them to commit to things they're going to do in the first batch of executive orders. Like covering left wing groups that were for Bernie Sanders but lost was still useful because if you kept in touch with them, if you kept in touch with Sunrise, with uh, uh, the anti monopoly groups, you got like a sense of what they were going to sign the first month of um, first day, really. They, they ended up having an action plan of executive orders, and that was useful. Like it was, um, but you, you can't like drink in everything. And I don't think it took, took the idea that I, I'm saying that there's gonna, there are groups that are just pushing stuff out that's like no one really supports it, it's not useful. Um, but you have to stay in touch with them. And maybe they're only going to get five candidates who are not Trump to agree to something. But the uh, drone warfare against cartels is a good example. That is not, Trump did not give a speech saying it. Uh, but once Asa Hutchinson, DeSantis, and those people said it, that's in the conversation. It's something to ask when they start to try stepping up, when there's, there'll be a point when there's a, you know, advisors and you can see who they work for, what they did. Um, and that the, it ends up manifesting in okay, this who's this person who just got point, uh, appointed deputy homeland security secretary? They've said this on their record. They've said they want to do this. They want to hire these sorts of people. You have like stories to feed on for um, not not just for yourself, but like interesting, relevant stuff. Uh, other uh, that prevents the news consumer from being like, who, where did this guy come from? Like that's always my goal. Is like, how do you have the reader never ask? Where did this come from? And I always say, like, oh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that weird thing I heard about six months ago uh, and ended, ended up with trafficking. Honestly, it, um, I, mean, I think we might be out of time. That's like if I my biggest frustration with Trump coverage is he has so much policy he's laid out his agenda on that is so different than what he did before. Uh, not just it, so different from what like other Republicans have run on different enough from what he did before. And that gets lost in a lot of coverage. The coverage will be just you know, how many rallies did he hold? What's his reaction to that? And there could be much more interesting coverage of Trump just based on the actual promises he's making and talking to virus. And there is. When it's written, it's like Isaac Ernstdorf at the Post or uh, uh, Jonathan Swan at the Times. When that's written, everyone's like, I can't believe this. So you, the best reaction is always, why is the media not talking about this constantly? <laughs> uh, which everyone's probably seen. Yeah, share the New York Times headline. How come this isn't what all the media is talking about? Like, well, then you're on the right track. <laughs> you're, you're paying attention to, to somebody, asking relevant questions, explaining how they would do this. And people who read it are like, how come I'm just seeing footage of him outside uh, at the Fulton County uh, jailhouse and not reading this? Like, well, you could be reading that. <laughs> just read that. Pay, pay for the paywall and re read the story. Stop complaining. That, like, that's the right kind of reporting, I think. I'm just going to ask really quickly. I mean, what do you feel positioned you well to go to a startup? Because I yeah. feel like at points where that's been on the table, like I felt like I don't have, you know, the sourcing built up or the bylines behind me to make that decision. I mean, what went into that just beyond, you know, this is a mission that I think is cool. Yeah, I think if um, if I if I had uh, a different point in my career, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I have just been doing it for so long. And, you know, frankly, on, on Twitter had enough followers where I knew uh, that People who I cover know who I am, and even if it's semaphore and not the not like the post, they would say, "Oh, it's worth talking to him." Um, that would not have been obvious uh, for the particular beat I'm on. It would not have been obvious um, for a lot of people to do that. Um, and it's it's like the the, the reasons that people know my stuff are some some good and some bad, but in general campaigns they'll respond, "Oh, it's you, yes. Uh, it, but we've read your stuff. We will talk to you." If you're not in a position where somebody would say, ah, yes, we've seen your violin before, they might see Startup I've never heard of, whatever. Um, we did have, Shelby, who covers Trump for us, though, did not have, like, a long island reputation. And she's done fantastic because she just did the work of introducing herself immediately to all these campaigns. She had the semaphore intro, which is, we're doing this in a different way. We're not, like, bite-sized like Axios, but we're not, like, writing a long-winded story that your candidate's barely going to be quoted in. We want to, like, break news on what your candidate's doing and saying and, who you know, who's funding it, who you're hiring. And that worked. Like, the can we were, being a startup covering politics in the beginning of a, of a cycle like this, as weird as the cycle is and as unrewarding as it is compared to 2020 or 2016 from a reporting perspective, um, that was very helpful. If it was, you're working on um, a aviation for CNN, but I have a startup that's going to also cover aviation, that might not be as obvious. I think aviation is interesting, but like there's not going to be the same the same hook. Um, yeah, but everyone here is covering political things. So <laughs> I will say like 
people who went who were covering other beats for us, uh, like Liz Hoffman at the journal, uh, was at the journal came to Semaphore. She had a lot of sources and a lot of good reputation on that beat. And then once she moved over, instead of being one of the people at the journal who may or may not get the story, everything she did that was that was a scoop was was broadcast. You know, she got a CNBC contract. Her book sold well. Like, um, I hate I ha I've gone the whole conversation without using the word the word brand. Um, but no, that's real. That there are pe there is a if it's not just there. I know people who do amazing work. Every story is well reported. Every story has great details, but they've they, no one ever thinks to put them on TV. Like nobody's like racing to hire them away for their publication. Um, it is it is uh, uh, it, the only thing I found is just being around DC, talking to people, getting to know people, so that when there's an opening that comes up that, that they that they might hire you is the only way to do it. Um, but for me, I could only I could join the startup. I think a lot of us did. Uh, it, was, it was again people like Shelby who were starting out, knew they were good, and we knew they were good, but like wanted to do something new. And people who had been in this long enough, me, Benji Sarlin, Jordan Weissman, uh, Ben, uh, who people would keep keep reading us if we if we did this. Uh, I think if I was thirty and I at that point, my, if I had just done in like four or five years of smaller magazines and nobody knew who I was, I I wouldn't have done it. I would have been like, no, let me try to see what I can get out of this big publication. There are. I mean, there are jobs, though, where you're, like, aggregating content at a big publication. Let's say if you, there's choices, you're at CNN, and you're just kind of rewriting stuff, or the, uh, the Hill, uh, um, and somebody gives the opportunity to go out with a budget and cover your own stories, that would be a good choice. But for me, it was leaving a, a publication that I loved a lot, that people I knew were reading it, like it shows up on my doorstop, that was... I had to like bet that they would keep talking to me if I left, and that was basically correct. Yeah. Well, let me go mm -hmm. one more real quick. So, if if Trump were to win the nomination mm -hmm. and defeat Biden, what would be your headline the next morning? <laughs> um, George Soros defeated in plot to <laughs> control the government. No, no, no. I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I. I think. Um, are we thinking like a long times headline where you pack some stuff in? Like uh, uh, Trump, uh, you, I think you'd, the story would need to include Trump who tried to overturn his defeat in an unprecedented manner for our president, uh, overcame that to reclaim the presidency. Um, uh, get You'd have to get, this is not the headlines, I'm not good at writing headlines, but you'd have to really get in, like it wouldn't just be, wow, look at how shocking this success is. Get into like all the things he said since he left the presidency. Not all of them, but uh, Trump, who had left the presidency um, at, with this unfinished, this has set, has promised to act immediately to finish this border wall. You'd really want to say, in this, you'd need to build up the situation of not just a guy won the presidency, but somebody who has been president and who has a gigantic agenda of both policies unfinished and revenge. How he would do that, and I think you'd be pa paired with just some feelings on the ground from. All sorts of people who, because uh, an attitude that that's out there is that um, if <laughs> if America were to were to elect Trump after all this, it's just you're never going back. It, like you'll always be the country that elected the the former leader who tried to overthrow the government. You'll always be, um, uh, you know, uh, I want to make a comparison to like say some other country that's famous for bad governance. But it would be the kind of thing if you described it, the, the old uh, rule at, at Slate, uh, George, Josh Keating's thing. If you could write those headlines and coverage for like ha something happening in in Bolivia, I think everyone would know how we write about this. Like, oh, what's wrong with this country? They elected the guy who went to who was almost in jail, who's going to pardon himself. Like, I think it would be good to have that concept in mind and not just write a glib. Trump wins, huge comeback. It would have to be tr Trump, Trump with with. with, with yeah, I feel I feel like that wouldn't be the right way. That would not cover the gravity of it. I feel like, well, but if if it was like he didn't win and it was Nikki Haley gets elected, you know, that would be a different story. Republican uh, with you know, first female president, uh, Republican, you have to get into agenda. But it would be that would be easier. Like nation elects first female president. I think that that, is, that one's short. I can do that. Trump would be. I can only think in like the Times headline with like three commas. <laughs> like you need to pack a lot into that. Yeah. Well. The, the questions and the discussion uh, underscore the need to bring David back again okay. <laughs> and soon. Um, but it was, it's been fascinating. Okay. And we don't want to hog your time. 
uh, you've been extremely generous and uh, thank you very, very much for yeah, sharing, you know, your expertise and, uh, and knowledge with us. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.